Okay, well, thank you for joining uh, our fourth and final session of the National Beef Cattle Evaluation Consortium Brown Bagger webinar series. Uh, if, you, if you haven't already, I encourage you to visit the nbcec.org website, um, and that will be the home for the uh, uh, recorded sessions from this year. I'm your host today, Matt Spangler, faculty member at the University of Nebraska in Lincoln, Nebraska. So we have, uh, pardon me, we have two, uh, two speakers today. Our, our first one's going to be Dr. Larry Keene, who's a research geneticist at the U.S. Meat Animal Research Center. Um, and then the second, hopefully, uh, will be a colleague from Ireland, Dr. Uh, Donna Berry, and we'll round off with an uh, invitation to the 2021 BIF uh, Annual Convention from Dr. Dan Loy. So our first speaker, uh, Dr. Larry Keene, who's going to visit with us about um, opportunities for additional data capture in the U.S. For those of you that don't know, uh, Dr. Keene was raised on a diversified uh, cow-calf feedlot grain and hay operation near Hartwell, Nebraska, received his bachelor's degree in animal science from the University of Nebraska, a master's degree in animal breeding from Colorado State, and then a PhD in animal breeding um, from Virginia Polytech Institute and State in 2005. He's currently the research leader of the Genetics Breeding and Animal Health Research Unit at the USDA ARS US Meat Animal Research Center or US Mark in Clay Center, Nebraska, and is the co-leader of the US Mark Germplasm Evaluation Program, um, which I'm sure is, is familiar to many in attendance here. So with that, uh, Larry, I'd be happy to turn it over to you. Thanks, Matt. I'll go ahead and get the slides here. Okay, well, as Matt said, um, I'll be talking about opportunities for capturing additional data in the US and, and what we need to be looking for in terms of, of adding to our phenotypic database to do a better job with the genetic evaluations that we're already doing. Um, most of you are aware um, of where national cattle evaluation is at in the US today. Um, in general, breeds are using genotyping arrays to supplement uh, traditional pedigree evaluations uh, using a single step procedure. Um, these are data, these data that I have here are a little old, probably actually close to a little more than a year old. So these are quite a bit higher than they are right here already. But uh, most breeds are currently using these arrays and genotyping um, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of animals each year across the industry to add to the genetic evaluation systems. Um, almost all of these are using a single step procedure uh, where you'd be refining pedigree relationships using a G matrix approach, uh, G blup as some would say, and, uh, and accuracy is increasing considerably if relationships that are being approximated through these gene matrices are close to the phenotypes. Um, and it's particularly uh, helpful in cases where it's sorting out Mendelian sampling over and above what was done in pedigree source of blood. Um, a crossbreed prediction is still getting better um, and, and working better for multibreed. I shouldn't say it's not working well. It is working well now in IGS. Uh, with, uh, with trying to get uh, breeds working together. What I meant by that was that a cross-breed genetic evaluation still have difficulty identifying the same marker sets to use across all breeds, always consistently, but using large numbers of sets, it works pretty well in the single step program. 
So thinking about this as our framework for national cattle evaluation right now, what advances can we have that make the most impact under this system? So if we think about potential areas where we can add accuracy, um, one thing that I think we'd all say and, and preach to the choir here uh, is that we need increased phenotyping. And uh, I think this is something we would have said in any era of genetic evaluation in the United States, but it's even, if anything, more true now um, in terms of trying to export data from from one segment of the, a breed or a set of breeds to another segment um, through connections in, in genotypes. And what we see right now is that uh, we do a very good job and traditionally have done a very good job with weight traits and genetic evaluation and to a lesser extent with carcass traits with some fertility measures, longevity measures within the seed stock cow herd. But there's a lot of traits that just are not covered very well in our commercial sectors and are really profit centers in the commercial centers sectors. And, and seed stock organizations are suing, certainly doing a very good job of making sure that, that these economically important traits are starting to get measured in seed stock herds, but they don't necessarily mean the same thing as what you might expect in the media in the commercial setting, for instance. If we look at uh, commercial cow longevity and fertility versus longevity of animals in a seed stock herd, uh, the reasons that animals are cold, if, if culling reasons are not part of the overall um, genetic evaluation, the reasons why animals are cold may be very different in a seed stock operation versus a commercial cow-calf operation, depending on what the objectives are. In addition, although we do a good job in many cases of following cattle through uh, to increase accuracy of carcass data or small feed intake projects or even disease incidents in some cases, uh, generally it takes a very structured program to follow animals from a steed stock uh, herds into the commercial sector and then recover all of that data. Whereas while, while we have these populations of seed stock animals, uh, we have, have several hundred thousand more data points in, in our commercial data sets that are happening every year at the same time. And being able to recover some of that data would move these sorts of traits along much better than what we have in our seed stock system now. I mentioned also other areas that we can add accuracy um, would be knowledge of causal variation. This hits a little bit about what I mentioned on breeds uh, before, but trying to understand where marker sets are and where those accuracy gains could happen will also require tremendous increases in phenotypic databases. And uh, Basically, without going into that very much deeper, I just want to emphasize that all of these objectives to add accuracy are going to require phenotypes in one way or another. So many of you are aware of the germplasm evaluation program at U.S. Meat Animal Research Center and, and objectives there um, have been to try to increase uh, increase knowledge of tools that producers can use based on current breed and animal differences within breeds using uh, sampling from highly influential sires from, from most of the U.S. breeds of cattle, beef breeds of cattle. And with, I won't go into the structure that I have here. This is just our base slide that we use for GPE, but suffice to say we are currently evaluating as well as possible uh, 18 breeds that are registering the most animals in the United States and and uh, have genetic evaluation systems. So that's a, a tremendous resource, of course. Um, we we uh, what the reason I really bring this up is we do measure several of those commercially important traits, um, which are kind of here in red, as the non-standard uh, genetic evaluation national cattle evaluation traits realize some of these are in in, uh, in national cattle evaluation, but maybe not to the same extent of what we're measuring on terminal progeny, for instance, in the germplasm evaluation program. 
And, and this, this uh, emphasis is very useful for providing tools for management later, decision support, especially on a breed level, but also understanding what the genetic relationships are between some of these traits that are commercially important and the traditional seed stock substrates that we that we uh, have in national cultivation right now. So in terms of, of GPE then and what the role might be then, I kind of mentioned some of this, breed differences, getting an industry strap shot of where breeds are ranking um, at the beginning that supplements the cross breed EPD program. Uh, getting has a heterosis estimate and targeting breed specific heterosis. So are there combining ability differences with, with, ant, with different types of breeds and how can we capitalize on that? Uh, getting genetic correlations, obviously heritability with that for these indicator and economically relevant traits, particularly when we're trying to transition across to the commercial sector. And then I mentioned genomic discovery too, that, that this population can be useful for that. Um, although there are limitations based on the power that we have with all of that. So, um, so bringing on the limitation then, part one of the limitations of this program is just the environmental scope that we have. Uh, we're located in South Central Nebraska, and it's very representative of East meets West in terms of, of the management of cattle here in this area. But if you, if anyone's ever visited us here, you know that that the area that we have our pastures and grazing on uh, would be corn if we weren't there right now. And while the climate's similar, things like soil type, system interactions of soil, even crop residues that are available here that are not available in other parts of the country make a difference potentially in what we find here. Um, and understanding more about that um, is one of the focuses of, of us sending our cattle away in a grand challenge program within the agricultural research service to other management systems to see, for instance, would cattle be different if they're being raised on wheat pastures in the winter or winter range somewhere else. Um, the other limitation is just size. And while we have 3,500 progeny per year approximately within the program and one of the biggest single research herds in the country or in the world, um, we're still limited in marker tests with the, with the number of markers being uh, greater than the number of records in many cases. And uh, particularly in a single step concept, uh, large scale genomic predictions are still difficult from our setting. These are things that we're actively, of course, try to work on and fix, but just realize that, that no matter what, if we're going to get into these commercial trade complexes, we need to do more than just a research herd that may supplement the information, but we need phenotypes out and beyond in the industry too. So if we think about commercial population data, um, the, these really, if, if you're talking to seed stock producers, these are the real consumers of the selections, the seed stock selection decisions that are being made and, uh, and should be a real emphasis of the decision support and indices that are being produced within and outside of breed associations. Um, all of those profit potentials should be geared toward commercial cattle production. And so the question is, can we also identify ways to recover commercial data to inform these seed stock decisions? So if we think about commercial data recovery, um, traditionally commercial data has very, been very difficult to obtain. Um, cow calves, if I think about commercial sectors listed there, um, sires are often unknown. Um, we have a lot of multi-sire mating going on, so pedigree, uh, methods to recover that data have been difficult, uh, even with different types of algorithms that have been proposed for that. Data are not reliably collected on individuals. In fact, if you look at what's collected in, in commercial applications, such as things like feed intake, often it will be on a pin basis rather than on an individual animal in a feedlot. Um, fertility measures may be something that's measured much more on a herd setting and, and not recorded well in terms of calf successes in large extensive systems. Um, and, and 
just the combination of all this says that relationships, at least from a traditional sense with pedigree and and what animals are really belong to what cow, those sorts of things, those sorts of things can be very difficult to track. So if we think about trying to recover that data, um, genomics and, and the, the system of single step evaluation has a lot of potential to alleviate those concerns, partly because the genomics could allow us to directly tie um, individual or group animal genotypes directly to national cattle evaluation. And group means in this case may be very useful uh, I won't go into it, but we've talked before in other brown baggers and other years on the on the use of DNA pooling, where you could combine 100 animals or 50 animals from a group of individuals into one genotype set and get back uh, basically allelic frequencies for those uh, for the 50k array, for instance, and use those allelic frequencies as a plug-in directly. Uh, along with the group mean phenotype as a plug-in directly into genetic evaluation. This is something we've prototyped here a bit um, with, with uh, some cooperation from a few students and, and postdocs at the University of Nebraska, a uh, continued area of emphasis and something that's been uh, moving along also in Australia right now. So this is just an example where you could save money with current genotyping steps and use group means. I don't want to hinge this talk on DNA pooling because as genotyping gets cheaper, uh, trying to do more with individual animals may be, may be more useful than just this, this DNA pooling approach. But think of this as a transitional step that might allow us to tie together data from a, a commercial system as a mean into our national cattle evaluations. And the other thing to think about then beyond just having this tie is we need to incentivize these commercial uh, producers and, and, and data centers, so to speak, from, from the producer to the stocker to the feedlot to the abattoir, uh, figure out what we can do to incentivize data collection to where it could help them and help their system if we were able to actually recover that data. So this is something that's happening a fair bit right now. If you look at articles by several different uh, seed stock breed, uh, breed associations or, or other industry press releases, there are several places where uh, one of the big things that, that these industries are trying to do is to help commercial producers take advantage of what they have available in terms of genetic selection in their breed. And, and some of these range all the way from uh, trying to help the producers get premiums uh, for selling animals um, from their cow-calf operation to feedlots, for instance, because they might be guaranteed to produce more marbling or, or to grow faster or whatever the case might be. And additionally, perhaps uh, providing ways to get EPDs on some of their cow herd uh, as part of that genetic evaluation system in the seed stock um, provider uh, in order to help those producers make better decisions within their own commercial herd. So these are things that, that I'm speaking of that already have some of these incentivizing in place. What can we do to these, uh, to these other groups of commercial, uh, in the commercial cattle industry, what can we give them that will help them either make management decisions now or selection decisions for the future and incentivize maybe that data coming back into the national cattle evaluation system. So, so just to give you an example of how a little bit of information can make a big difference. If you are a commercial feedlot, for instance, just knowing the breed alone from data output from the GPE program, for instance, could make a huge difference in what uh, what that feedlot might do with the cattle. And knowing breed alone is goes well beyond just knowing the color of the group of cattle they just buy and the ear length of that cattle of those cattle. Um, if we if we look at that things that we see in GP program, for instance, we have endpoint differences, growth potential differences, intake differences. Um, you know, things that can be targeted on marketing grids, uh, maybe 
interactions with implanting or feed additives, all those things could be helpful. And, and the commercial EPDs I mentioned could help even more over time. So um, just look at an application and let's say a feedlot buyer obtains a lot of 100 animals, unknown origin from a sale barn. And uh, if we use this DNA pooling approach I mentioned before, it could cost maybe $300 or so at the most, that's probably a high estimate, to genotype that group. And can that data be recovered? Well, one thing we know we can do off of that now, even without the national cattle violation, is predict the breed composition of that group. And so if uh, we wanted to look at ways to return off, uh, investment, let's say that lot they bought turns out to be half Sarlay, quarter limiting, quarter Angus, we'd say, well, based on GPE data and, and other data out there, uh, this group of animals would potentially have a high yield potential, a high carcass weight potential, maybe less quality grade opportunity. So maybe the idea for that feedlot for this group is to feed this animal, animal group 10 days less on feed and, and uh, don't worry about hitting the same, uh, same targets for, for grade. And just from that alone, from the cost of yardage and feed, you could get greater than a $10 head return on those 100 animals and well and easily pay for genotyping. If you had an animal that was uh, a lot, that was generally three quarter Angus, quarter Hereford maybe, uh, instead you go a different direction as the feedlot operator and go for high quality potential, use a carcass quality grid and, and get 10 to $25 more per hundred weight on that set of animals just because you know something about them coming in and how you might treat them, target the ration, increase marbling potential as a result. So that's just a quick example. This could be much more refined if we tie the uh, pool genotypes to the National Cattle Evaluation System, as I mentioned, and get a prediction on what the performance of that pool might be from what we know about the seed stock EPDs. So how do we get that uh, data back and recover it? Or what, what do we want to do with that? So. Um, we know that getting that data back will improve genetic evaluations and commercial management is in my target. That's, that's basically what I'm proposing here. Um, we can improve genetic evaluations just with the accuracy and the performance data that we're asking these commercial entities to produce and trying to give them real management strategies for what they can do with what we know about the groups of animals that they're training. DNA pooling is just an interim strategy and cheaper genotyping uh, using sequence-based approaches that we're starting to explore now could open up many more possibilities. And uh, either way, the genomically enhanced predictions of group, uh, group uh, genetic potential could help with their management and understanding what that group genomic makeup could help inform our future seed stock decisions. So, um, with the databases that are out there, with national cattle evaluation, um, they could work with commercial community programs, uh, try to figure out how systems that we're using in active research right now to deal with cross-spread data in those pools. And maybe this requires a bit of a feed structure or a collaborative argument, but if you understand the give and take here and what, what basically getting data into the national calibration might help uh, with management decisions later. This, uh, this can help make decisions for you. In terms of uh, commercial producers, um, they can recruit, record the performance of that pool. If you're a cow-calf operator, you can, re you can report average uh, conception, average uh, calf numbers, average calving date, whatever the case might be. If you're a feedlot, you can record pin feed intakes. Uh, overall health records, whatever the case might be as an average for that. And basically those those if if commercial producers were keeping a database on their own, they could predict the future pools using their own data and tie together their time and space and increase accuracy of the decisions they'd make. So so yes, right now both of these entities could use their own databases, but I see a vision where the most optimal solution is to get them shared 
and and use the data from one to inform the data from the other and uh, forget the fee structure, try to do something where we would uh, try to do something where where getting the management uh, decisions into the commercial sector also helps recover data from those means into the seed stock sector. So I think this could be a really synergistic relationship. Um, this data is out there. Anybody uh, that's really keeping up with it in the commercial sector could be trying to do this on their own. I think we need to move as an industry to think about how we do this together. And I realize this is a more communal situation to try to propose something like this, but I think we have much better opportunity and you'll see really where benefits can pay with this if we look at uh, what Dr. Barry is going to be uh, presenting in the next session for things that are already happening in Ireland. So in conclusion, I think uh, current commercial marketing programs would benefit from using genomic relationships to performance databases uh, to help trace things back to genomically enhanced performance uh, prediction for marker assisted management or genomic uh, national cattle evaluation enhanced prediction of their management of their animals. Um, synergistic agreements would be highly beneficial and should be explored as soon as we can really get this done. And similar tools could inform design and analysis of applied research programs as well to help us understand how do we use these intermediate steps of pooling in our genetic evaluation system? How do we account for breeds better in our model when we're getting breed groups in, in, these, in these lots, all those sorts of things. But just having that data will make a big difference and move along both research and, and uh, the development of synergistic systems. Um, with that, I'll go ahead and take any questions. I don't know where we're at with uh, Dunner right now, Matt. Yep, Larry, uh, he's on. We might handle one quick question from you, and, and then we'll move on to our next speaker. Um, okay. Joe Pascal asked uh, if uh, you have enough markers to differentiate American Brahmin from Nalore, and how you might, uh, uh, how you would treat um, the beef master, Santa Gertrudis, et cetera, breed crosses, or would they just be a percentage of Boss Indicus? Yeah, those are really good questions, Joe. Um, in the short term, um, I don't think we have enough in our database necessarily from what I'm aware of uh, in the U.S. for the lore. Um, we would have more of that data if we were using partners in uh, South America, not surprisingly. Um, in terms of differentiate the differentiating the American composites, if you will, the Brief Masters, Hanager, Tudis, Brangus, um, Brayford, et cetera. Um, right now, the easiest thing is for them as a percentage of Boss Indicus, uh, and and it is difficult in a group of animals to say, uh, did I have. Uh, I mean, it, it's not necessarily easy from a pooling perspective to say, do I have a lot that's 75% purebred Angus and 25% Brahmin, for instance, um, or do I have something that's more of a Brangus for all the whole lot? And, uh, and based on markers, that part's not easy. What that's going to take uh, is something that helps us derive on probabilities of haplotypes and lengths of those haplotypes to say what's what's the likelihood that this is where this is coming from. This is an area we've been trying to get refinement on as we work on this, but but the jury's still out on how well we can do that. Um, all of that said, having that percentage could be beneficial overall in knowing what that that having a percentage of boss indicus could be very beneficial even up here in Nebraska uh, for cow calf efficiency and so forth, uh, which our data shows quite well, knowing that could be useful for making decisions going forward. Um, understanding how to tie to the genetic evaluation system um, will take a little bit more work in those cases, but I, I do think it's, uh, it's a possibility. Okay. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Larry. I think we'll uh, 
we'll go ahead and uh, and move on now. Um, uh, our, our next speaker, as I suggested at the beginning, is uh, from Ireland, Dr. Dona Barry, um, who he says in his bio is a beef and then in parentheses and sheep farmer. Um, so I don't, I don't know if he was implying emphasis there or not uh, for this audience, um, but uh, from the south of Ireland. And he's a statistical geneticist. Uh, at, at the research center there and is responsible for research on genetics of cattle, sheep, uh, and, and sheep in Ireland, which includes investigating novel approaches to data collection, undertaking genetic and genomic evaluations, and derivation of breeding goals and the development and deployment of associated decision support tools. And so we're really pleased to have him with us today to talk about what they're doing in Ireland to better make use of, of available data resources throughout the breeding pyramid. Uh, so with that, uh, Donna, hopefully you've been able to get access to the slides and can drive, drive them yep. as it were. Yep, great. You can hear me there, Matt, Jeff? Yep, you sound great. Go ahead. Excellent. My, my Wi-Fi can go up and down sometimes, so uh, let me know if, if there's any trouble. So, yes, I am actually a beef and, and sheep farmer. Um, I'm on leave this week, and the weather has turned, so I spent most of today up on a shed, and it's absolutely freezing, so I can barely feel my fingers at the moment. So, look, uh, as you said, Matt, I'm going to talk a bit about data. Um, I'm going to give you the Irish experience, and we're going to go through a, a few little things that I think are, are pretty cool. Um, before I, I start, um, yep, right, let's move on, yep, oh, there's a bit of a time delay. No harm putting this slide up, okay, so this is the challenges that is, is facing us, and we, we talk about volatility and political instability and, and all this type of stuff, but this is really, really important. We must produce almost as much food in the next 30 years as we did in the entire 2000 years before this. So we have a massive challenge ahead of us. But if you're optimistic like me, you can also look at this and say we have an, a massive opportunity ahead of us. So people will talk about uh, the impact on, on environmental hoof print, et cetera, but there is this huge challenge facing us of global food security that we must almost keep at the back of our mind. So what I'm talking about is how can we use data to fulfill this massive challenge. Before I go any, any further, I just give you one slide on, on Irish beef uh, production. Right. So in Ireland, we have just over 7 million cattle and we have just under 1 million what we call suckler cows or beef cows. And that is declining year on year. Um, so I'm actually a suckler farmer as well. We have an average herd size of just less than 20. It's around 19. And we have around 26,000 herds that have more than 10 cows. So we actually have a very small number of, of beef. Of, of, of beef, but we have a large number of beef herds, but there's a very small number of cows per herd. And that's because the majority of our beef farmers and sheep farmers are part-time. Uh, there are four main types of beef production systems in Ireland. So there's suckling, where you have the calf is born with the cow and it's suckled until weaning or until slaughter. Um, then you have animal or farmers who buy in cattle that are close to finishing. We call them store animals and, and they, they just keep them over the winter and sell them on then to other farmers in the spring. And then you have farmers who purchase those animals and bring them right through to slaughter. So they're stored to beef. And then finally, you have farmers who purchase in calves, predominantly dairy calves, so beef from dairy herds, and they keep them all the way through to slaughter. So you can see in total, we have just under 100,000 farmers really. And that's, that's the breakdown of them. But that's, that's enough from an Irish beef uh, production perspective. Another real important point that if you talk about data and uh, you, you may be a little bit jealous of the system that we have in Ireland, but it's really driven by legislation. So from an Irish perspective and an EU wide perspective, every single animal in the country has that tag on the right hand side, the top right. Um, they, they are unique to the animal. They have two of them. When one of them falls out, then you must repurchase exactly the same tag and put it into the ear. You cannot sell an animal unless it is carrying two of those tags. And they remain with him or her throughout her lifetime. 
below that, the blue card there, as you can, if you read that, it says a passport. So every single animal in Ireland has a passport, right? You must legally record the dam ID. We, that was brought in post 1996 because of uh, BSC. You must record legally the gender of the animal. You must record every single birth of an animal. And because therefore you know the dam of the animal, you will also know the calving dates of all of these animals. Um, you must uh, notify the department of all deaths. That includes if you slaughter the animal. And every time you move an animal. So when I move an animal, I must actually ask the Department of Agriculture a few days in advance if I'm allowed to move that animal. And then they will grant you permission and you must move that animal within a few days. So there's a huge traceability. Also, every single animal that has slaughtered, we record its carcass weight, confirmation and fat score. And all of that is legally recorded. There are also incentives to record data. So you would hear a lot probably about Europe. Oh, the farmers in Europe, they get a lot of money, uh, have subsidies, et cetera. But we've been pretty lucky in Ireland. We would have, um, uh, I think, a good um, inroads with the Department of Agriculture where we say, well, rather than giving people money like social welfare, get them to do a little something. So get them to record the level of dystocia or calf quality or docility or put a milk score on this cow on a scale of one to five. One, no milk five lots of milk we'll come back to that one because i think these this is really something to offer from a data perspective okay so that's that's where we're starting from and that of course then enable us enables us to move from pasture to plate so in ireland if you buy a, a steak or an animal that is slaughtered you can trace that animal to every single farm that has been on been on back to its mother to its grandmother to its great grandmother you don't legally have to record the sire, but you do have to record the dam. So you have really good traceability across the entire system. Another really nice thing about um, Ireland, um, and I, I don't believe you really have the same thing from a US perspective, is we have a cooperative called the Irish Cattle Breeding Federation. And you can see its members there, farming organizations, um, AI services, milk recording, so this is dairy and beef, herd books and the Department of Agriculture. They all sit on the board of this, um, it's actually a charity, this ICBF. So they have 80 staff and these are geneticists and people working in databases and uh, development of reports, but also decision support systems for farmers. Their objective is to ensure that the next generation of animal are better than the previous. I should probably have put the word better in inverted commas because what does better mean? And we're always changing our opinion, of course, of what better actually means. So the key thing here is that they are an independent genetic evaluation system for the farmers and uh, for the industry. So if you, um, there is, when you look at any individual animal in Ireland, there is only one genetic evaluation for that animal. Across the whole country. Their other key importance is that they have very close relationship with stakeholders like the Department of Agriculture, with myself and Chagas, but also the universities. So we do a lot of the research for them and we do a lot of that on their own computers, but when we write computer pro programs, then we actually pass that to them. So all of the genomic selection in Ireland up until around two or three years ago, all of the genomic selection was done using my software. Um, and there's no transfer of money or anything like that. We write papers and they get all of the software. The other key important thing here is that the data is shared for a common vision. ICBF will say that we don't own any animals, so we don't own the data. We house the database and we own the database, but that's only the structures. It's not the data within. It's the farmers that own the data. And I'll come back to that at the very end about who actually owns the data. This is the database in a nutshell. Um, so you can see the ICBF database sits in the middle. You have AI companies and milk recording agencies. A key point there is look at the arrows. There are two ways. So the data is going into the database, but there's also reports coming out of the database to the AI companies. All the AI companies put their data in there. All the milk recording companies put their data in there. Okay. All the factory data that you can see in the slaughter factories, that is a one-way arrow. We've actually recently changed that in the past few weeks to be a two-way arrow, where now when an animal is slaughtered, 
we can give the uh, abattoirs um, a genetic evaluation for meat eating quality. We just launched genetic evaluations around three weeks ago, 24th of September, whatever that was. On the very bottom, you can see Chagas. Uh, so we have an advisory service. I just see my internet is unstable. Hopefully you can still hear me. So we have access, if I go into meeting farmers, so you know, maybe 40% of my time is talking to farmers. We have what are called discussion groups where 20 group, 20 farmers or so would come together in a locality and um, we would discuss issues. But rather than going around the, to each farmer asking them, well, what's your growth rate? What's your weaning weights today? What's your in-calf rate? All the data is already there. So we can compare people. We can find the good farmers in the group and say, what are you doing differently to get such a good fertility rate? And then the, the guys with the uh, lighter weaning weights, well, what are you doing incorrectly? Or not probably that incorrectly is wrong because maybe they're not feeding them appropriately. And on the top right, then you can see the research. So the key thing here is all the data is going into one national database. And you can see the amount of records, 1 million AI records per year, 1.5 million carcass records per year, 850,000 genotypes per year. That's probably a million genotypes per year now. All of this is going into the one system, the actual raw data and also the genomic data is going in there. It is a, a pool or resource for research, but also for use in uh, one set of genetic evaluations. And that's the data. Now, just very quickly, uh, and this might be a little bit boring, but I'm just taking a, a few stages across life and I just listed out a few traits that may be of interest and it's not exhaustive, um, but it gives you a bit of an idea. So we can be measuring animals, and I'm talking here about beef, birth, at weaning, at yearling, or at slaughter. And of course, then you can also talk about the, the traits that you can develop within that, so growth rate, et cetera. Look at the commonalities across there. So weight is always important. Health, it's always important, no matter when or what age the animal is. Quality is always important. So quality at birth, quality at weaning, quality at slaughter. All of these different metrics are different. They're different measures of quality. So at weaning or at yearling, you might be talking about ultrasonography, ultrasound of the of fat depth and muscle ribeye area. And at slaughter, you have the actual traits, but they're still quality. Intake is important. Environment is gonna become important. And it's linked obviously to intake. Mortality, hugely important. So you can see all these traits are more or less exactly the same across time. We have a few differences like in, in birth, does just gestation length, calf vigor, something we don't talk about, dystocia or calving difficulty. And at slaughter, well, we're working at the moment and we can dig into this more during question time is age at slaughter. I'm a very simple person as the lads will probably tell you. And when people talk about the environmental footprint of, of, of ruminants, they're talking about methane production per day and things like that. Well, if you can just slaughter the animal younger for the same carcass weight and confirmation and fat score, well, the animal is eating for fewer days. So that has a huge benefit, both economically, but also environmentally. Of course, some of the females go on to become cows and at first calving uh, and lots more calvings and then eventually at death. Again, look at what's happening. We have weight and health exactly the same throughout life. Quality, so the cull cow carcass uh, metrics, really important. Feed intake, environment, reproduction, mortality again coming through, body condition score, progeny performance, and longevity, all really important traits throughout life. Before I, I dig into it, and I might end up being a bit stuck for time, I just want to quickly show you uh, how genetic evaluations work. And I'm going to um, demonstrate to you, and this is one of my pet projects at the moment, is doing a genetic evaluation for farmers or breeders. So if you get a bull catalog, you open it up and you see an EPD for carcass weight and an EPD for ribeye area and an EPD for weaning weight, etc. But what if I was to give, there's, there's what, there's 77 participants here, most of you are probably farmers. What if I was to give you an EPD for carcass weight? So you look at bulls and if they're positive on ribeye area, you say, oh, that's a good bull. But I could also give one to each one of the farmers on this call. Positive means that you're getting good ribeye areas relative to where you should be based on your genetics. Negative is your ribeye areas are, are, are less. 
to what you should be based on your genetics. So very, very quickly, let's look at how this works from a, a genetic evaluation perspective. So we have herd A and herd B, and let's just take carcass weights. These are kilos for, for Ireland. So we have a bull here in the middle, and he has one son or one daughter, 310 kilos in, in herd A and 345 kilos in herd B. And then we have another two bulls beside him. And in herd A, that bull is 320, and in herd B, it's a different bull at 340. Yep. And there's lots of other animals inside there, but let's just forget about those animals for the time being. So we give that reference bull a value of zero. Now, what I should be asking you is which of the two bulls on the, on the left and the right are better. And you probably think that the bull on the right should be better because his carcass weights are 340 kilos. While the bull on the left, his carcass weights are 320 kilos. But when we do a genetic evaluation, we see that the bull on the left actually is heavier because it's not really the weight of the animal, it's the weight relative to the, the reference so I'm not sure if you can see my cursor here, but the bull here is, is at 310 kilos, the zero kg bull, the middle bull, and the bull on the left, his progeny weigh 10 kilos heavier. Hence why he gets an EPD of 10 kilos. The bull on the right, even though they're heavier, right? The carcasses are heavier at 340, he's lighter than the reference bull. So he gets an EPD of minus 10 kilos. So what you're doing here is you're actually saying that the herd B is actually producing heavier carcasses. So it's producing carcasses that are on average 16 kilograms heavier. So if, you, if that farmer and herd B started to feed more concentrates, the carcasses would get heavier. The genetics don't change, okay, because it's exactly the same animals. The carcasses are heavier, but you give the herd this EPD of plus 30 kilos. So it is producing carcasses that are 30 kilograms heavier than the expectation based on its genetic merit. And what I'm demonstrating to you here is that when we talk about data, we like to talk about genetic evaluations. That's really important for genetic evaluations. But what I want to show you is there's more to life than genetic evaluations. So I know also there's a few students on the line, and this would be a really common equation. It's kind of an unwritten rule as well when you're giving a talk on genetics. I'm not sure if Larry gave an equation, but you're supposed to give an equation. So here's my equation. The phenotypes of what you see is a function of the genetics and the environment. What that also means is the phenotype is a, is a function of the blups. Um, so, so that's what we would call genetic evaluation sometimes. The olden times best linear unbiased predictions. But what we forget are the other parts, is the environment, is the blues. So let's just look at an example. We have two animals, right? They, they, on the left-hand side, they're both good, good for growth. So you go out and you look at these two animals on, on two different farms, and they're growing at the same rate. The top animal is poor genetics, but the farmer is feeding that animal on, giving them lots of concentrates. So it's, it's, it's overcoming the poor genetics. While the second animal excellent genetics it's it's ability to to grow is really massive but it's, it's exhibited or it's exposed to poor management so the question is is would you give the same advice to both of those farmers no you wouldn't to the farmer on the top one you would say well you're an excellent manager so you actually give him a positive epd he gets a positive blue but you say you need to work on your breeding while the guy in the bottom the second uh, farmer, you're saying, your breeding is perfect. Now we need to work on your management and we're going to get excellent growth. Okay. So I think I don't think we're using the, the um, genetic evaluations enough. We, every, every genetic evaluation breaks down the, um, the phenotype into its breeding value or its EPD and its herd effect. But we essentially throw away the herd's effects and we publish the EBVs. But I think that's a, that's a mistake. Also, when we talk about data, we talk about, okay, we need to weigh the animal and we need to look at its fertility and we need to uh, um, look at its quality, et cetera. But you must always have other information. You must also have other information like the gender of the animal because we know on average, male cattle weigh heavier than female cattle. So if you have a particular bull 
and he, he, he you, you tend to slaughter more of his males, you, if you don't account for that, the genetic evaluation will say that that bull produces heavier carcasses. Not true. Age is also important. Parental information is also important. And contemporary group is vitally important that we need to know these group of animals are all fed the same, but the other group of animals beside them are fed differently or they're managed differently or they're in a different part of the farm that is more exposed or something like that. So you don't expect them to perform as well. So don't forget about when we're talking about data, you must also record that ancillary information. And it goes back to an earlier point I made about the EU legislation is that we must record the gender. We must record the birth date and the slaughter date, right? So therefore you do have the age and we have to record the dam, but we don't have to record the SAR, but the genomics enables us to do that. The other point I want to make uh, before we dig into the individual traits is you don't need a huge amount of data. For a genetic evaluation perspective, it used to really annoy me in Ireland um, when I was doing my PhD. People would say, oh, we're, we're going to get nowhere um, in a breeding program in Ireland because we only milk record a third of our cows. That was dairy. So we only milk record a third of our cows. What are we at? We'll never have a good breeding program. But we had over 1 million cows. So we were actually milk recording 400,000 cows. Norway, which would often be put up at the, the pedestal for the best genetic evaluations in the world from a dairy perspective, they only milk recorded 200,000 of their cows. They milk recorded 90% of them, but they, because they had a smaller population. So we actually milk recorded, we had data on twice as many animals as the Norwegians. But we were saying, oh, we're not good enough. But this is just showing you here the vertical axis. This is actual accuracy. This is not the BIF accuracy. How it changes depending on the number of progeny a bull has. So you can see with a trait like this is a heritability. The green line there is a low heritability. It takes you a while. You need a lot of progeny to get up to high accuracy. However, for a trait like uh, carcass weight, which would be around 35% heritable, maybe 35, 50% heritable, you don't need a huge amount of information to get a, 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 an accurate genetic evaluation. Okay. So let's go back to this one. Let's just dig into some of these slides or these, these traits very, very quickly. I'm running a little bit out of time, so we're going to go fast. Birth traits, right? Just listing out a few of them. Here's the heritability of them. I just more or less guessed them, um, but it's not a guess, sorry. It's based on, on what we would see internationally. This is the number of progeny you need to get an accuracy of 70%. So you don't need a huge amount of birth weights. Now, what you, by having these, these data, especially at a, at, a, at a birth, you can decompose the weight of a calf into its genes for birth weight, but also into the maternal effects. Similarly with health. So we know the most important thing you must do for a calf is the three, two, one rule. Get three liters of colostrum into the calf within two hours of birth from the first milking. So there's a huge maternal effect on actual animal health. Right? Economic values. A lot of people, we can fight about this one, record the weight of the calf. But why do you record the weight of the calf? It's because you want to use it in a lot of instances to predict the calf in difficulty. But why not just to ask the farmer, was it a calving, it was a difficult calving? Okay, it might be very easy in some instances where there's a, a rangeland um, and there's a lot of cows. But in Ireland, we don't record birth weights. We actually ask the farmer, well, was it a difficult calving? It's very heritable and we can make really good genetic progress on it. Is there new traits? Vigor. Very few of us are recording vigor. But any of you that farm will know like we are the, the worst thing for sheep or, or beef, is to try to get that calf to stand and to suckle. It just would break you. So calf vigor is hugely important. Uh, yearling and we weaning traits. Again, we just look at quality. I'm going to dig into that one uh, for a second because what we did is we asked farmers to score the quality of their calves from one to five. One was poor, five was, was really good. This is at eight, eight to nine months of age. Everybody said to us, what are you doing that for? It's a pure waste of time. You need to go out and you need to ultrasound these animals. These are farmers. They, they make their living out of knowing quality cattle. So when we asked them, when we did the genetic evaluations, the heritability was 30%, which is really good quality data. Now, 
let's dig into the next one. And this is a, I just, next slide is a published paper. You can look at it yourselves. So here's where we asked the farmers to score their animals on weaning quality. And we correlated it then with the total, genetically correlated with the total meat yield of the carcass. We're getting a correlation of 0.4 between a score, an ob a subjective score by 100,000 farmers. They were given no training. They were just told one is good and five is bad. Or sorry, the other way around. Uh, and we looked at those animals when they were slaughtered. Later on, correlation of 0.4. You look at the very high value cuts. These are your strip lines, your fillets and your, your uh, rumps. Correlation of 0.5. Linear classification then by professionals, right? The heritability was more or less the same. Correlations, very similar, right? To what the farmer. So these are guys who are trained and they're harmonized against themselves and they don't do that many animals. And then the farmers, we were just told one is, one is good or one is bad and five is good. Very, very um, similar results. But of course, it's, you didn't have to pay the you have to pay the professionals. You don't actually have to pay the farmers. Slaughter. Then I'm running out of time, so I'm just going to go fast. Again, we have very very similar traits. One thing I think we really need to look at more is age of the slaughter, um, and it, its impact on feed efficiency. So again, when people talk about feed intake, what they're actually talking about is feed intake per day. I would prefer an animal that is eating for less might eat the same per day, but it's eating it for fewer days. So not only is it eating less, but it's taking up less room in the shed and the opportunity cost of having other cattle inside in it is, is also there. At the cow, then again, one thing that we're really missing from a cow perspective is, is feed intake. Just go back to this uh, milk score thing. So here's where we asked the farmers to score their cows, one poor milk score, poor milk ability, five good milk ability, just based on looking at them. You know yourself how much milk was inside in the cow's udder. 20% heritable with a genetic correlation of 0.7 with maternal weaning rate. So this is where we weighed the calves and decomposed it into a direct effect or a maternal effect. So just by looking at the cows, because these are farmers, they work with the cows every single day. They're really good at actually predicting it. Free data or free no types, as we like to call them. So just to finish up, uh, oh sorry, um, importance of pre-selection. Look, if 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 you have a bull, uh, he's going to produce progeny that are some are better than him and some are, are are worse than him. In this situation, you get a breeding value of zero. But what would happen if you only slaughtered the the uh, half the animals of that bull and only the good ones? Then the bull would get a breeding value that is really really good because you you didn't you didn't show the genetic evaluation system the bad ones. Or if you did the other thing, if you only showed the genetic evaluation, the bad ones, so here would be seed stock produ production, for example, you kept the good ones for breeding and you slaughtered all the bad ones, that bull would come out as actually being poor genetically, unless you had additional data like a weaning weight, which you could include in a multi-trait. We haven't done it in beef, but we've done it in, in, in sheep to show that there are criteria that the farmer, and you notice any farmers in the audience, that you look at an animal and you determine by looking at the animal, well, am I going to keep her if she's a heifer or am I going to slaughter her? Just, I think this is my, my second last slide, guys, so I haven't gone over time because it's a big point is who owns the data. I would argue there's rarely a, a sole owner. To, to, to say that you own something, it relates to property. So there's the issue of real property and generally the farmer owns the animals or he owns the land, right? So if that was it, the farmer could say, I own my data. But there's also the equipment to, to record the data. So the weighing skills, do you own the weighing skills? Did you develop the weighing skills? And if you didn't, then you don't really own, necessarily own the data because somebody else was involved in that. More importantly is the intellectual property. So the decision rules associated with that. So you might have a system and there are many systems out there that weigh your animals or take your feed intake of your animals, but they're actually giving you support underpinning that. So therefore, they could argue that they also own the data. So it doesn't mean you don't own the data. It just means you may not always be the sole owner of the data. Where to now, the big question for me is what's in it for me? Why am I recording data? And this goes back to these blues or good reports. New traits, health, meat eating quality, environment, age at slaughter. The other one I think which is important, and I'll finish with this one, is the whole area of citizen science. Um, Google it. 
So citizen science is where the people themselves get involved in the research. An example could be rate your steak. So you have a QR code like this on all the steaks in the supermarket. People come along, they cook their steaks. They all cook, cook it differently. Some will burn it, some will, will medium rare, whatever. It doesn't really make that much of a difference. You've got so much data. Then they scan the QR code and they rate it from one to five. This is huge benefits. Other than collecting data for potential use in genetic evaluations, it also creates awareness. So the, the consumer says, okay, well, actually tenderness is important and my data is contributing to a national genetic evaluation to make the tenderness of the next generation of, of animals even better. So Rob, or um, yeah, and, and um, Matt, sorry, I went a little bit over time, but that's it from me. Hopefully you heard it. <laughs> No, no worries at all. That was that was great, and uh, uh, I know you uh, uh, you had to interrupt your day to to do this. So if we were keeping a ledger, uh, I believe I I owe you. So thank yeah. you. Uh, I'm not sure if I told you, but our clocks went back a few days ago, so that threw me. Uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> I won't ask how many days it takes to adjust to that, uh, but. Uh, there are a couple of questions that came here, uh, came through for you. One uh, related to docility, um, and they're asking if you could uh, explain what the metric is that's used, the, the stage mm -hmm. of the animal's life at which that's scored, uh, and in general, the, the status of, of docility in the Irish population. Okay, so it's subjectively scored by farmers on a one to five scale. I'm a real big believer in this. Again, it's a little bit like the citizen science. So when the farmer records, and this is not belittling, well, I, I'm not belittling farmers because otherwise I'm belittling myself, is that you feel a bit of pride. Ooh, somebody wants to know about my cattle. Well, I'm going to tell them. Now, if the farmer scores all fives, which of course a lot of them will do, oh, my, my animals are lovely. My animals are absolutely brilliant. For the geneticists in the audience, you know that that doesn't contribute to anything really because there's no variability in there. So you, the farmers score one to five. They score at weaning. Um, so the same, as when, the same time as when they score quality. And then they also score as cows. Um, geez, I can't remember. We just finished the analysis. The correlation is very strong anyway between docility scored as weanings and docility scored as cows. How is the average docility in Ireland? Um, depending on who you'd ask, I think it's pretty good. We still have a lot of people killed by livestock or seriously injured by livestock. Limousine would, would, would have a reputation for being bad for docility, but they've really improved that and gestation length over the past few years. Um, but again, there's nothing like talking to breeders and they will tell you who the, uh, the bad docility bulls are. And when you look at their genetic evaluation, the vast majority of the time it actually sticks up and that's the real the real quality control for me good another question here um asking if you got a lot of pushback from farmers when you implemented the animal passport program in ireland i see that that came from matt lucy i'm not sure what matt lucy is doing on a beef talk but um I can say, Matt, because the EU brought it in as legislation in 1996 uh, post BSE. So up until then, we had uh, one brass tag in the cow's ear. When she lost it, uh, then you just put in any old number again. So you had zero traceability. And Ireland was saying we had great traceability. We had zero traceability. But with BSC, uh, you had to have strong traceability. And have a have a quick look at the 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 literature and stuff when they talk about parentage misidentification in Europe in particular. It's always at the SAR level, not at the dam level, because that has implications for BSC. So if you get an animal that goes down with BSC, the, the first thing they'll do is they'll trace up the female line. But there are errors in the female line. It's just nobody wants to talk about it. So I didn't get any pushback, Matt. Great, great. Thank you. I, again, thank you to, to both of our, our speakers today. Um, it's great to hear one ideas of what we might do here in the States and, and research work under the way underway there. And then what is being implemented and, and further refined, I guess you would say, um, uh, there in Ireland to honestly make the best use out of the data that we have from an industry perspective to continue to make uh, not only genetic change, but help inform management.
Mm. I'm going to, to go ahead and move on. Um, Dr. Dan Loy is uh, a professor at Iowa State, um, and I don't know if he looks forward to uh, or is, has enjoyed this role or looks forward to, to hosting BIF. Um, but, uh, but they're going to host it in 2021 there at Iowa State, and I'll let Dan share a little bit more about that. Yes, thank you, Matt. And on behalf of the planning committee, we would like to extend an invitation for you all to uh, uh, come to, our, uh, to the BIF convention and let you know that we're really looking forward to, to hosting uh, the 2021 BIF convention at the uh, Iowa Event Center in Des Moines, Iowa. So please put June 22 to 25 on your calendar for this in-person face-to-face event. And I know many of us will be ready for that. So stay tuned for this. And with that, Bob, can you roll the video? The state of Iowa and Iowa State University are proud to host the 2021 Beef Improvement Federation Annual Research Symposium and Convention. Join us and experience how Iowa provides the beef industry with innovation to application. When innovations happen, the state of Iowa and Iowa State University always seem to be there. Iowa was the first state to ratify the Morrill Act, which helped create land-grant universities across the country. For more than 150 years, Iowa has been bringing practical, agriculture-based curricula to the people. Iowa State University also was there when the Beef Improvement Federation was founded. Iowa State's professor, Richard Wilhelm, helped create the federation, and Jay Lush's work with animal breeding methods proved to be breakthroughs. Today, Iowa producers continue this legacy of innovation while applying what they learn to their operation. You can see it in Iowa Beef's prime carcass quality, which regularly measures 50 to 100% higher than the national average. Quality is on the rise while the amount of land used for grazing shrinks, inspiring continued innovation on how herds are managed. And this innovation doesn't stop in the field. The 2021 Beef Improvement Federation Annual Research Symposium and Convention is located in downtown Des Moines with easy access to the airport, hotels, and local restaurants. For entertainment, try Prairie Meadows Casino or Living History Farms, which brings the state's past to life. And Iowa State University is just a short drive north with its research and teaching farm located minutes from Central Campus. Or take a trip to the McNay Research Farm near Sheraton, where the 60% prime herd has been selected for marbling for 25 years. We hope you'll join us in Iowa for the 2021 Beef Improvement Federation Annual Research Symposium and Convention. Take this opportunity to experience innovation to application. A little bit uh, about what it shared on the audio that uh, you might not have gotten, but it talked a little bit about the legacy of beef genetics at Iowa State, a little bit about the Iowa uh, beef industry, and uh, basically a welcome for uh, all of you to come to Iowa this summer and see us in person. So thank you. Yes, thanks, Dan, for the, the formal invitation to BIF in 2021. And I have, with that, though, I would like to, to thank all of the participants that are still on for, for joining the last session today and, and for uh, the entire series this year. So appreciate your participation. Um, we will uh, send out evaluation uh, surveys to the, the registrants. And so please give us your thoughts on the program and, and in particular, uh, we'd be keen to hear your suggestions for topics for next year. And should there be any uh, talks you want to go back and listen to again, or perhaps some you missed, um, these recorded sessions will be posted on the NBCEC.org website under the Professionals tab and then the Brown Bagger tab. So with that, on behalf of myself and my colleagues, uh, Bob Weber and Dare Bullock, We'd like to thank you once again for your participation and again, look forward to your comments on the surveys once those come out. So thank you and uh, uh, please uh, enjoy the rest of your day and week. <laughs>